All right. Esther. Say, Esther, you probably think of the phrase, for such a time as this. It's one of the great lines in all of Scripture. Who knows, Mordecai said, that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We're going to read Esther 4, 10 to 17. Sort of a, as a, a, a text that kind of capt captures the uh, summary of the book. If you'll stand with me and, and follow along in your Bibles or on the screen, I want to read Esther 4, 10 to 17. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. They told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered them. This is what is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And you, you can't read this if you have any kind of a grasp of, of the Scripture and not think about Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael who were threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, know this, our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we'll perish. I mean, there, this, this, this bold commitment to their God. And you see this both these instances in captivity, in a time of captivity. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to watch now the Bible Project's overview of Esther. It's a little longer than some of them we've done. It's about nine minutes long, but it's, a, again, a, I think an excellent summary of the The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. The main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days. And it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. 
And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai. But all of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep. And he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading. And he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution. And the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all she's Jewish and second that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai who saved his life and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink so when he hears this news he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. 
This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai established by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, Purim. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder of which Mordecai and Esther are a part, not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah, like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says, no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. And he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working. And to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. Okay, it's a great summary. Uh, a lot of issues, a lot of issues. First of all, uh, the idea of providence. The word providence, literally when you break it down, is pro video. Pro meaning for, video meaning, meaning see. Our word video is that God seeing for his people, watching for their good, uh, watching with a view to acting on behalf of his people, his, his providence. We get our word provide. God provides uh, from that. And there's many, many stories in the scripture that pop up when you think about that, uh, that image. And he does that, as the, as the video pointed out, in spite of and not because of uh, the character. And, you, and we're going to get to this. We'll see this in the theme in a few minutes. But there's this absolute commitment of God to be faithful to his covenant promises, which, which must issue forth through his people. And that's what you see in Esther. So let's, just, let's unpack some things here. Uh, the story of Esther, by the way, of her life that we have captured in this book, we showed you this previously. Josh showed you last week, and I would pointed out earlier, fits between chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Ezra. Uh, between the first return from captivity led by Zerubbabel and the second return led by Ezra. This is, this is the only biblical account we have of these vast majority of Jews who chose to remain in Persia, Persia being what we would know, recognize as modern-day Iran, rather than to return to Palestine after the exile. They were, be, they were disobedient not to return. Um, and yet God protects them uh, in spite of that. As was mentioned in the video, his name does not uh, appear uh, one time. The name of God does not. We're going to talk about a, a mnemonic device that's used that we can't see, but it's in the Hebrew. We'll talk about that later. Um, the book is divided into two sections. It's uh, this 
the Haman's plot to to execute, exterminate the Jews, really, chapters one to four, and then and then uh, Esther's courage uh, when she responds to the counsel of, of Mordecai, who was a kinsman, resulting in this great deliverance. So you have the great danger to great deliverance. That's the that's the movement of the book. You see in this that God uses ordinary men and women to overcome impossible circumstances to accomplish his gracious purposes. Again, that's a message of hope and encouragement. Uh, one, of the, one of the key things the devil does to us is beat us down and discourage us that we're just not usable, we're not useful, we don't, we don't have this, we don't have that, and try to point out our shortcomings to neutralize our zeal for God and, and to serve God. Uh, this book shows us that God's able to, he, he not only rules, he overrules. And that's what Romans 8, 28 teaches, really. That all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And are called according to his purpose. The book of Esther takes place in Persia over a period of 10 years, all right? Uh, from 483 to 473 B.C. And I told you about the, you've seen the, the outline here, this threat to the Jews, um, and this comes up, this arises during a feast of Ahasuerus. Um, and then in that time, Esther is chosen as queen. Uh, Haman makes a plot to exterminate the Jews. And then uh, the scene behind that is that Ahasuerus is at his winter uh, palace in Susa. Uh, this, king, this, this banquet that goes on for 180-something days just basically to absorb himself in his vanity, uh, ending with his desire to parade his, his queen out to show how beautiful she is, not, not to adorn her, but to show, it's really for his, his purposes, she balks, which is unheard of, and so she is deposed, and that's where, that's where Esther comes into play. Uh, Mordecai tells her, don't disclose who you are, don't, don't tell them you're a Jewess. Uh, she's in captivity, they wouldn't necessarily know immediately who, who she is. Uh, and so she's chosen. Her beauty is very appealing. And of course the whole thing turns uh, in triumphant format for the Jews uh, when, this, when Esther holds these two banquets as was just described. And this feast of Purim, the word Pur of course is uh, the word for dice. And it's, uh, some people differ whether Purim is just a plural of, of, of that, uh, die, from die to dice, or whether the, it's tied to the two feasts and the, and, the, and the two days that will develop. But this feast of Purim where they celebrate God's uh, providence over the protection of his people. And that's how it flows. Okay, so we, so we kind of have a sense of the uh, story. I want to I uh, read you, this, this is one, one of the most pathetic uh, funny, but pathetic sections in, I think, certainly this book and most of the scripture. It's in chapter 6 of, of Esther, where, uh, remember, the king can't sleep, so he asks his, uh, one of his advisors to come and read him, uh, the, uh, read to him out of the book of memorable deeds. And it's during that time that he's reminded of how Mordecai had, uh, had basically informed on a plot to execute him. And so he's thinking, I, f I forgot about Mordecai. And so... He wants to honor Mordecai. He never has done that. Haman has, has already ascended to this number two position and basically uh, has gotten the king to go along with the idea of exterminating these Jews who are not, they're not true Persians and they're sort of a blight on the land. And so the king is thinking, how can I honor Mordecai? Haman is thinking, I need to go before the king and continue to curry his favor. And it's in chapter 6 where the king says, who's in the court? And they say, well, Haman's in the court. And so in verse, uh, verse 5, and the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. The king said, let Haman come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And you and I know, reading this, that he's thinking about Mordecai. Haman doesn't know that. Haman said to himself, who would the king delight to honor more than me? And he said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden. 
and on whose head a royal crown is set. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. Let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. There's this recurring phrase, the king delights to honor. Now you read this and you know exactly that, that, that Haman is wanting to be treated like the king. That's what it boils down to. He wants to dress the king's dress. He wants to, he wants to ride the king's horse. He wants to have a crown. He wants to be paraded around, uh, willing to grant that the king is honoring him, but he wants this. Then, verse 10, the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew. It's hysterical. It's, it's humiliating for him. He's, and so he ends up having to do this. I think that's just one of the most intriguing uh, episodes, certainly in this book, but, uh, but in all of the, all of the, of the scripture for irony. This, uh, let's talk about the introduction and the title. This story, as I said, happens between chapter 6 and 7 of Ezra. And uh, her, es Esther's Hebrew name is Hadassah. That's, that's just like when we talk about the Israelite children in the fiery furnace. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Babylonish names. Their, their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Isha, Ishmael, uh, Hananiah, Ishmael, and uh, I just went blank. I told you to him a while ago. Hananiah, Mishael. Hmm. It'll come back to me. Uh, well, this is her, her name's Hadassah, all right? But her Persian name is Esther. And I was telling Star earlier, the name itself is, is derived from the Persian word for star, for stara. Stara, and so the formal name came uh, es Esther, like star. And so she's given this name by the, in, in her Persian captivity uh, because of her beauty. She's like a rising, shining star. The author, it was said in the video, we don't know who the author is for sure. There's a lot of conjecture when you read, read different commentaries, different backgrounds. Uh, people take things said, for example, in Esther 10, Two and three, it seems that there's language used there that speaks of, uh, of Aswaris in the past tense. And so, uh, so who would have written this uh, at that time around 464 B.C. perhaps, which is when he died, uh, trying to piece it all together. Some writers suggest that Mordecai wrote it, uh, but that seems unlikely. Um, we know that Mordecai kept records. We find that in, in Esther 9, uh, verse 20. Uh, but you don't get a sense that he's the, he's the author of this. But it's, it's pretty clear to those who study this intently that whoever authored Esther used Mordecai's records and may have had access to the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of, of, of Medea and Persia. Some said Ezra and Nehemiah may have written it. Uh, but, but when you compare writings by them, it's not the same style. I'm just Parenthetically, let me say, one of the things you do in, in textual criticism is you not only look at content, but you look at, at phraseology, word usage. Uh, and it doesn't, for one of them to have written it, they would have had to change their vocabulary and the way that they, the way that they wrote for it to be one of them. So the style is very different. So the, the conclusion is we don't know, but it probably was a, was a contemporary, a younger contemporary of Mordecai who had who had learned from him about these things, and he probably composed the book. Probably written as far as date and, and setting. Um, again, Ahasuerus uh, was called that by the Jews. Uh, Xerxes is the, is the Greek name. His Persian name, I don't know if I can even pronounce it, uh, Kishayarsh, and uh, he was the king of Persia from 486 to 464 B.C. When this, this feast that's referenced in chapter 1 uh, took place in the, his third year, according to how the book opens up, or 483 B.C., there's a historian, an external historian called Herodotus, and he refers to this, this banquet uh, as an occasion when the king was preparing for a military campaign against Greece. If you go outside the scripture again and read, you find out that in 479, uh, this king was defeated by the Greeks at Salamis. Uh, and so he comes back basically licking his wounds, having, having fallen in defeat. But the banquet was, 
apparently a preparation for that. And it's after this, of course, when Vashti is deposed and he has a beauty contest, basically. And we find with this, this whole choosing of Esther, look at Esther chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> We're told that, that when Esther was taken, the king asked Suarez into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Um, the video again described uh, the king as sort of an emotionally unstable fellow, a, a drunk, easily swayed, and, uh, and that's exactly how he, how he comes across. Uh, with this palace in Susa, where a lot of this takes place, was destroyed uh, about... Uh, 435 B.C. by fire. So you're trying to piece a date together for this. So it seems that it was, it was it's going to be uh, around four, my notes here, I just lost my, my note. It's going to be after this 10-year period, sometime after 473, is when, uh, when this is going to be written. As far as the theme of this, uh, by the way, this is a story about Jew Jewish people whose lives are spared and they stayed in Persia rather than coming back home from captivity. And so it's, uh, it's one of those, those, you don't commend their example but you recognize in it that God's, God's love extends in, in uh, depths and directions that we can't even imagine because he is rescuing a people who have been intentionally disobedient to the, to the opportunity that he's afforded in his providence for them to return home to rebuild. This is the group that stays behind. Some have conjectured in some of the reading I did because they had gotten used to life in Persia. They were not, they were not in any hurry to get back home. They liked how they were living. It was, not, it was not as bad as some of the other captivities, Syrian captivity, Babylonian captivity. The theme and purpose is, as I said earlier, God's sovereignty and providence and his determination to protect his people in order to be faithful to his covenant promises. And that's what you've got to understand. You, we realize when you, we, early days we were reading this uh, in, in Genesis and uh, get to the flood, God destroys humanity. He saves eight people, rescues them so that they can continue this, uh, this lineage, this heritage, that his covenant promises to be fulfilled. He doesn't, he doesn't destroy the people again. He is so committed to his name, to the truthfulness of his promises, that he will, out of this people, bring the Messiah. Uh, that he's, we won't say he overlooks because there are consequences, but he is willing to work with them in spite of and work through them and, and protect them and keep them uh, as a people. I think it's interesting irony, again, uh, that Haman uh, is not a Persian so much. He's a Canaanite. And if you've, if you've been tracking with us throughout this study, you know that the Canaanites despised the Jewish people. And the Jews had no, no love for the Canaanites. And so this crops up again in this book uh, many, many years after their first encounters back in, the, in reading through the first five books of the Bible and the history books. Here they are, at odds of one another again, a Canaanite trying to destroy the people of God. The Jews have a history of that. You, you need to know. You should recognize that, that when you study history, of a, the apex of that perhaps was, was Hitler's Nazi Germany, where he determined to exterminate the Jews and used a lot of interesting arguments, if you're familiar with that, that climate in Germany then, of how the Jews were oppressing the people, taking jobs from the people, and so on and so forth. Uh, as an excuse to, to exterminate these people. Uh, the purpose of, one of the purposes of, of Islam is to eradicate the Jews. And so this has been a sort of a theme of theirs. And if you understand that, and you find yourself doing some reading from Jewish types, the idea of Israel as a suffering servant, when you, when you say suffering servant to a, to a well-educated Jew who's, who's orthodox in his religion, he thinks of the nation Israel. You and I think suffering servant the Messiah. 
That's not how they think. They think of the nation as being, as the nation suffering for the whole world. It, it's always suffering at the hands of the world. It's always suffering for the sins of the world against it. And, and there's a history here. Because we're looking back here uh, four in, in, in the fifth century B.C. that this was going on. So God's purpose to be faithful to his covenant promises, which means he will protect his people at all cost, no matter what. And he does usher Messiah from these people uh, when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, born of, of a Jewish woman. Well, keys, what about keys to Esther? Well, this word keeps popping up, but you need to understand it. The key term or, or phrase is providence, the providence of God. <clears throat> uh, this, is a, this is something you trace all the way back to, to Abraham. Abraham stands on the mount with a knife, his son, his, uh, his son's close, close to being what we call a young man, lying on the, on the sacrifice pier, and God provides. Isaac looks at Abraham and says, Father, I see the wood and the altar. I see the knife. Where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And, and so we, one of the names that God takes on at that scene is Jehovah. We reckon Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. On the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Well, here's this continuing theme of God providing uh, against what seem like insurmountable odds. Uh, we've, you've heard from the, from the video, uh, if you know any background of this, once the, once the king issues a decree, even if it's a foolish decree, he cannot correct it by Persian law at this time. And so God steps in in his sovereign hand. And uh, by the way, we need to recognize that this is the same God who watches over us. Uh, at my friend's funeral last Sunday, one of the fellows sang uh, a fairly recent song by uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman, I think, called Sovereign Over Us. It's, and it's just it's about God's providence in, in being there uh, even when the enemy comes against us. What the enemy tries to do, you're working for our good is the, the theme right out of Romans 8.28. So this word providence, the key verses, we've already read uh, one of these in the, in the larger context where we read 4, 10 through 17. I want to cite it again, chapter 4, verse 14, then chapter 8. Verse 17, chapter 4, verse 14. For if you keep silent at this time, remember now, this is... This is Mordecai saying to Esther, you need to go and reveal your identity to the king. He loves you greatly. And appeal to him as a Jew not to let the Jews be exterminated. And the chief, of course, responds, as we read earlier, well, but it's against the law. If I go in, I, I will risk death. He says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. That is a powerful, think about how, how hopeful that is. You may keep silent. But Mordecai has this, this unshakable faith that God will raise up a deliverer. And it's, very, it's very messianic, one who will come and deliver his people. And so he goes on and says, deliverance will rise from, for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. In other words, for you to fail to take action, this opportunity to stand in the gap uh, you have no, uh, no reason to believe uh, that God will even bless that. And he has said previous in the passage we read, uh, don't think that you'll escape. When this, when this comes down, the fact that you're, uh, you're wed to the king will not allow you to escape as a Jew being executed because of Haman's determination to execute all the Jews. And so... Who knows, of course, this is my favorite line. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It seems to me that we need to raise our children and our grandchildren for this, in this very vein. Think of it ourselves. Don't let the devil discourage and beat us about the head and say it's over for you. Uh, however he does that. You know, somebody said about, I think I told you about the life of Moses. Uh, when Moses, Moses lived the first 40 years of his life thinking he was somebody, he ran for his life from Egypt, lived the next 40 years uh, as a, 
running from the law, thinking, realizing he was nobody. And it was in the last 40 years that he discovered, as, as one writer said, how God can take a nobody who once thought he was somebody and make some, something out of him for his purposes and his glory. So we would look at Moses. I mean, he, he really did not become useful until toward <clears throat> the end of his life. So don't get discouraged. Rem just think in terms of opportunities that present themselves to you and let this resonate. Who knows? But God has put you there at this time for these very gospel purposes. Teach our children. Who knows? The season in which you've been born, that you're being raised, who knows? But that you may be being raised up by God. We need to train our children as if we're training uh, these champions, training the, the Psalms, talk about warriors, arrows, for such a time as this. And have that kind of a mentality. It is one of the great observations and challenges in all the Scripture. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And of course she acts on it <clears throat> and it, it, is, it becomes the means that God uses to rescue the people of God. Then uh, 8.17, Esther 8.17, in every province and every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. This is, of course, in the context where the king, realizing the error he had made in his decree to exterminate all the Jews, uh, goes along and makes another decree that the Jews have every right to defend themselves and to take the lives of their enemies who, who wanted to exterminate them. And so there's a great joy that breaks out, but it's very interesting to me the end of that verse, and many from the peoples of the country, many, many Persians, declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. They identified with the people of God. And this is a, this is a theme we've seen when, when the enemies would come against God's people in the wilderness wanderings and all, that, uh, that God was with them, evidently with them. And there was great terror that came and fear and amazement at the greatness of this God. And you see this here uh, in Persia when this other decree goes out and now the Jews will be allowed to defend themselves. And of course they do defend themselves. It's one of the problems people have with this book. We'll talk about those in a minute, that this, this whole bloodthirstiness that comes out. But it was God's means to spare them, protect them. Now the key chapter, of course, I've just read from that is chapter 8. Uh, when they defend themselves against their, their enemies <clears throat> in this, this statement that I just shared with you. Well, what about uh, Jesus? Where do we see Jesus in, uh, in Esther? Well, I, I pointed out a couple of uh, things that I think are uh, observable. Pull those up. She is a, uh, she's a Christ-like figure. She puts herself in the gap. She becomes a willing, almost like a substitute for the people. And her willingness to stand as a substitute for the people is honored uh, by, it meets the approval of the king. And that's, that's Jesus. He, he comes to live the life that we were commanded to live and we did not. He keeps the whole law for his people. He's willing to suffer the punishment due unto the sins of his people. His father is pleased, well pleased with his actions. He receives the approval of the father. And the, and the infallible evidence of God's approval is that he raises him from the dead. Then you have this, uh, uh, he's this, this advocate uh, that we need. Uh, John says in 1 John that if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so, so he not only uh, substitutes himself, he advocates for us. And that's exactly what Esther was doing. She was advocating for, for the Jews when she went to the king and begged for, their, uh, to be, for them to be spared. And so this is, uh, you see Christ's likeness, this, this, these images of Jesus in the book. But uh, that doesn't keep it uh, 
from the, from the problems that people have with it. Someone said that uh, Ezra, they were comparing Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. They said Ezra deals primarily with the restoration of the Jewish people after the exile. They, they come back and are recognizable as a Jewish people. Nehemiah deals with this, their, their spiritual, physical and spiritual reconstruction. They begin to come back together. Not only identifiable now, but, but coming together as a community. And Esther's focus is on their preservation, on how the Lord preserves them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of plot twists. In fact, when you read historically about how Esther has been handled in terms of its place in the canon, C-A-N-O-N, that's the, that's the Bible, um, it's been placed many places. In the Septuagint, in the, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, it was placed between uh, two apocryphal books, the Wisdom of Sirach and the Book of Judith. And Esther was found in between those two. Not a, not a really high commendation for you to, to look at as if it's one of the apocryphal books. Um, it's, it's found as one of the, what's called the five roles, uh, the other four being the Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes. These are books that are read on various holidays. Of course, Esther would be read and still is read on the Feast of Purim. There's no form of the name of God. Here's the, here's the concerns. is used throughout the book. There are 187 references to the Persian king. There's no mention of the law, the Torah, in the book. No mention of the, of the Levitical offerings, of the sacrifices, of, of prayer to, to God. There's nothing mentioned in the book that is supernatural that could be attributed to God. And these are concerns that people who have examined and, and dis had discussions and, and, and long meetings about what should be included as as having the imprint of the hand of God in it and what should not. And Esther, uh, if you know anything about, the, about canonicity, Esther almost did not make it into uh, the Bible. And yet I think we would be much poorer uh, without the testimony of God's providence. Uh, it's also never quoted in the New Testament, which is one of the, one of the markers for a, for a book having uh, authentic divine inspiration. Its background is around not a Christian doctrine or a Christian theme, but a nationalistic Jewish festival. And of course, I mentioned earlier the chapter 9, the, the bloodthirstiness of the Jews is problematic for some. In fact, so much so that the Jews uh, tried to counter this by, uh, by creating an apocryphal book <laughs> entitled Additions to Esther where it's full of references to God. Then here's some reasons, and we don't know that the, which one you'd settle on, but I just want to give you this. Uh, why is God's name omitted? Now, the, the people on the video uh, say that it's, it's sort of a stroke of literary genius to show, to, to keep the writer looking for God by looking at the activity of God. Here's some suggestions. The book was written in Persia, uh, and it would have been censored or profaned uh, by substitution of a pagan god's name had, had the name of God been introduced. In all likelihood, one of the Persian gods' names would have been, would have been absorbed rather than the true and living God. <clears throat> now, there's this general disobedience of the Jews. So it's a book about God rescuing disobedient Jews, and so there's this, this idea that God's hesitant to put his name upon, upon uh, wholesale disobedience. They preferred the comfort of Persia to the hardship of rebuilding their homeland. Uh, and this is what you heard in the video. That the silence was intentional to illustrate the hidden but providential care of God in spite of outward appearances. So you see this. You don't see the name of God, but you see the hand of God everywhere. And here's an interesting literary device. and We can't show it to you because it's a Hebrew thing. The name of Yahweh, those divine letters, which, which we would say, or Y-H-W-H, that, that replaces the Hebrew letters. The name of Yahweh appears in an acrostic form four times in the Hebrew text. And I'll just give you the, the verses. 
case you have access to a Hebrew Bible, Esther 1, 20, Esther 5, 4, Esther 5, 13, Esther 7, 7. There's statements made on the lines and, this, and these divine letters show up as an acrostic. So, so there's almost this sort of a secretive, hidden manifestation of the name of God, though his name as a name never appears. Now, with that in the background, the word Jews appears 43 times in its plural form, and eight times the word Jew appears. It's obviously taken from, derived from Judah, uh, a term applied to all the descendants of Jacob. So, so while you don't have the name of the God of the Jews, Yahweh or Jehovah, you have this identification of the people of God, the Jews, throughout the book. 40, 51 times total, singular and plural use. And that's kind of a little picture of a, of a fascinating, controversial book of the Old